Welcome back to Perspectives, the Honorized News. Since the announcement of the end of fuel subsidy payments, Nigerians have been in constant anxiety over the cost of basic goods and services. Transportation and food being one of the most basic resources were affected instantly, plunging people into constant worry about how to balance the new reality and the stagnant income levels. It's no surprise that in recent times, we have seen the price of essential commodities quadruple in some cases, with constant price fluctuations daily. This is no sustainable feat. Sales have dropped significantly amidst this worsening economic landscape, and it has become a serious cause for concern. The unprecedented surge of inflation has sparked a wave of lamentations amongst Nigerians who are left questioning the sustain sustainability of their livelihoods. The results of monetary policies have also pushed the local currency, the Naira, to an all-time low against the dollar, provoking anger and protest across the country. So much so that just a few days back, a two-day two nationwide protest was planned by the Nigerian Labour Congress, but was stopped on the second day after the federal government accepted to listen to a 17-point demand the Labour Union had made to President Bola Tinubu to assuage the poverty, hunger, and mass suffering inflicted on citizens by the policies of his administration. Whether or not these demands will or can be met remains to be seen. We are keeping our faith that the government have the best interests of the people at heart and will find real-time solutions to reduce the pain of the people. Arise News took to the streets of Lagos to gauge the feelings of the people about the ongoing hardship in the country. Since the turn of the year 2024, the economic situation in Nigeria has gotten worse. Nigeria is currently experiencing its worst economic crisis in the generation, leading to widespread hunger and hardship. The country's inflation rate is at an all-time high, as citizens now find it hard to eat three square meals a day. Many are going hungry, rationing what food they have, or looking for cheaper alternatives. It has affected me seriously, you know, uh, the purchasing power has reduced. We cannot even buy things the way we used to buy, like uh, food stuff. That one is the major one that have the highest inflation. So it affects me seriously. You know, the family, it used to be three square meal, but now it's two square meal a day. So that's how we are, we are managing it. The top priority now because of the inflation is the school fees is number one. Uh, food stuff in the house is number two. So we, we take care of those two things. Every other luxury, they are pending for now. Overall, annual inflation, which is the average rate at which prices go up, is now close to 30%, the highest figure in nearly three decades. The cost of food has risen even more by 35%. This week, the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, held protests in the main cities on Tuesday, calling for more action from the government. A litre of petrol cost more than three times what it did nine months ago. All the price of staple food, rice, has more than doubled in the past year. These two figures highlight difficulties that many Nigerians are facing as wages have not kept up with the rising cost of living. This situation affected me a lot because now these days now, it's something that we are getting like 100 naira up to 500, so we are just managing. So, and it's very, very, even school fees is very hard to pay. There is many things like that that we are doing easily before, even transport, fare, to eat. It has really affected me a lot, I will not lie to you. I'm really owing debt, like, uh, I don't need to say because if I should buy this market now that I want to say, I said finish now, before you know everything. I end up buying it like for 50,000 at the end of the day, I end up seeing 45,000 naira. So I'm not seeing anything from it, but we need to sell it so that we owe money. If I, if I should say I should stay, stay in the house and sleep, it will not help me at all. It will not really help me at all. It will be very, very bad. 
So it's better that I should just be good going like this. And it's even, even worse. The person that is even giving me this market safe, she's even complaining because I'm owing a serious debt since all these things has been happening. It is not a recent news. We are all facing it. But I do believe that with a matter of time, everything will still put in place, yeah? Of course, it affected me in a bad way. A lot of things that I used to do before. But what I'm trying to do now is I try to cut my coat according to my size. Most of the things that I'm doing before, I just have to put a limitation to whatever I've been doing. Before, I normally, if I'm going to eat in a day, I spend close to 3,005 to eat every day. But now, I, I must tell you, I must confess publicly, I spend 1,005 every day now. But before, I spend close to 3,005 to eat. Reacting to the economic crisis in Nigeria, President Bola Tinubu has appealed for patience from Nigerians, given the assurance that there was light at the end of the tunnel. Today on Perspectives, we will be taking a look at the dire economic situation in Nigeria, which calls for urgent action to address the crisis. It's that time when we introduce our esteemed guest. On the first segment, we have joining us Sarkeni Okulubu, the current Chief Executive Officer of Kenkoil Nigeria Limited, a real estate company based in Lagos. He's also a leading public affairs analyst with huge experience in public relations. Sarkeni oversees the efficient running of business activities covering property consultancy, lease, sales and development with incredible success over the years. As Honorable Commissioner in Delta State, from 2012 to, through to 2015, he ensured efficient use of resources for the development of his community with significant impact, executing 90 people-oriented projects on behalf of the Delta State Oil Producing and Development Commission, DESO PADEC for short. Between 2010 and 2011, he was a spokesperson for the Good Luck Jonathan Presidential Campaign Council. Feels so good to have you here. Thank, Thank you. It's my pleasure. As you can see, you saw the video that was earlier. Yes. You can see the piercing pain and hunger that people are going through in Nigeria today. <clears throat> the NLC and the TUC are supposed to be the opium of the masses or the voice of the masses. But as it is, it seems like there's a conflict even within, within the house, like a divided house kind of thing. So I wanted to address that briefly. But also, we also saw where the two-day protest was stopped on the second mm. day because NLC had given the government a 17 point agenda, agenda yes. to meet, mm. giving them a two week window to meet this 17 point agenda. But realistically speaking, and from mm. the past, how feasible do you think this is? First, the division between the NLC was not, uh, was not very palatable because we've always known the Trade Union Congress and the NLC to marry together, to marry to together with anything in terms of protest is anything, it's, mm. it's for anything, brings government to gets government's attention to a whole lot of things that should have been done and mm -hmm. you know so by the time that division came and uh, you saw Sifo actually having a press conference and insisting on the fact that oh look I'm not going to be part of this because there was no agreement that's what he what he said basically he said, he said if there was an agreement would have been able to say we're all going on with this mm -hmm. protest and a whole lot of Nigerians actually felt that the process at this material point in time was going to increase the suffering in the land mm -hmm. yes there should be protest but the protest should be all-encompassing. I don't think that protest would be said to be, have been successful because they suspended it by the second day mm -hmm. because they said that they were afraid they were going to be attacked. But if you look at the 17-point agenda, it makes a whole lot of sense. Mm. Stop taxing the petty traders. Stop collecting levies from them, the petty traders. Remove that from consumer items. Open up the borders. We are bleeding. The mm. Naira is on a free fall. Mm -hmm. Anytime you try to show up the Naira, you introduce $10 billion, you introduce $3 billion, you find that the dollar is mopped up and we are back to almost square one. Mm -hmm. Now, the dollar went to 1,400, it has gone up to 1,520 as at yesterday. We don't know what it's going to be like on Monday. Now, they say the electric buses that you have said that you're going to provide, provide them immediately. Mm -hmm. Then the kits, you know, there's this kit that government said that we're going to provide that in certain stations for people to be able to take their cars to convert from gas, from petrol to, to, gas, Look to gas, provide okay. them. I don't think those 17 points agenda is, apart from the minimum wage issue, I don't think those 17 points agendas are things that have not been on the table. These are, these are discussions that they have, that has been on the table between the NLC and between the government. And let's not forget that apart from the NLC, the ordinary Nigerians are very hungry. 
Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we do not say the buck stops at Tidubu's table. Mm -hmm. But he has said the buck stops at his table because that is the absolute truth. He says, don't pity me. Mm -hmm. We know this decadence started from the former the administration before. of Buhari. I know how many times I was on air complaining about most of these policies. I'm sure Nigerians can bear me witness to it, that these same things were the things we were talking about in Buhari's government, and some of us were being looked at as sabotage or those who were playing politics with it. Okay. But the truth is that it has come to bear that people have come to see that Buhari's economic agenda lacked focus and has put us in the present situation we have found ourselves. Okay, okay now that you talked about minimum wage, I think yes. we heard uh, there was some speculation that NLC wanted the minimum wage to be one million. If you ask for one million But how feasible is that? If you ask for one million naira, I was giving somebody an example. I had a property. I have a property, not had a property. One of the apartments, I had someone who pays, who was paying me as a then She chose to pay me in dollars. Mm -hmm. It was 3.6 million naira. That was what she was paying me in $10,000. That same property, I still own it. I have a couple of flats in that. It's just one way in Lekin. That same property, $10,000 now, let's just say it's $15 million, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nobody will even pay me Eight million for that flat. Exactly. That I even don't maybe if I get six point five million, I should thank God. Are you seeing how my property has completely devalued? Yes. And that's exactly what the NLC is saying. A million, how much is a millionaire in dollars now? Yeah, but how feasible is because it? Because if you have said that, if you have said, it's not, it might not be feasible, but they're looking at the monies you have said you have okay, saved the subsidy. I, if you are to ask me my own opinion, ideally, two hundred thousand naira. So why would why have you said two hundred thousand naira? Why have you said that two hundred thousand naira? Is that you're looking at rights at seventy thousand naira? I'm looking yeah. at a family of four. Okay. Me, my wife, my two children. I should be able to buy a quarter bag of rice. Uh -huh. I'm looking at transportation. Uh -huh. Apart from the red line, the blue line, this you might not be living in Lagos. You might not have the. Yeah. You know, you might not be able to get the services. So you spend nothing less than two, three thousand naira a day to go to work. Uh -huh. If you look at five days in a week, how much does that come to? If you look at what will come at the end of the month, so that's about sixty thousand naira. In practical terms, so in practical terms, two hundred thousand naira should be what the minimum wage. Okay, now pay. that we're speaking of practical, instead of a million naira, yes, because of the because. We, 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 practice the, we practice the mono economy. Everything yeah. is dollarized. Yeah. Any item you have, they'll, they'll try to give you the dollar equivalent of it. So if you look at the practical terms, 200,000 naira is less than $200. Well, um, I don't know whether it's, it's fair to compare. Because, because it was 30,000 yes, yes, 30, yes. naira. $200 or 30,000 naira as a twenty. But there are some things you can do with 200,000 naira here in Nigeria that you mm. cannot do with $200 in America. That's another debate for another day. That's but true. I think it's always, you know, when you, when you compare. No, but when you compare, compare, at the end of the day, you find out that it is quite close. It is quite close, but I'm yes. saying that if you look well, at it with you. as two hundred dollars, mm. it, it it does a lot to the psyche. Yes. Whereas there's some things you can do with two hundred thousand naira here mm -hmm. that you that cannot you can't do, do with. It. That's, that's like I said, that's true. another topic for mm. another day. But talking about expenditure as well, see this interest rate that CBN has increased from eighteen point seven to twenty two points. Twenty two point seven two. I mean, really. Point four hundred BP. You know, you know what amazed me was that when we're, we're looking at Cardoso having his first monetary policy committee yeah. meeting, I was looking at a situation whereby credit reserve ratio would be maintained, would even be taken back to maybe thirty. At thirty two, mm -hmm. he took it to forty five. Mm -hmm. How many banks can actually, in all honesty, maintain CRRU credit reserve? When you say credit reserve ratio, for those that might not understand, the minimum amount a bank can actually keep. Mm -hmm. It'd be just like foreign reserves. Then you say liquidity should be 30%. They let it at 30%. Then you now take interest rates. We're talking about the fact that banks are not lending. <laughs> banks, it's difficult for you to get this interest rate. If you don't lend, people will not produce. Exactly. People will not go, uh, go on to build. People will, you can't reflect the economy. Then you now take it to 22.72. So you know and inflation, thinking, don't yes. forget that inflation is 29.9. Of course, of course. And of course. Un unemployment has increased by 5 from 33%. The youth unemployment is still at 53%. Oh my God. So we're having the highest misery index we have ever had in the history of mm -hmm. Nigeria in over three decades. Because when you put unemployment and inflation together, it gives you the misery index. It, it, it sounds like, it, it sounds like all, all gloom and doom. But let's get our second guest in to also hear her perspective. Mm. Well, we spoke about here, we spoke about here earlier, the Adito, and here she is joining us from Arise London Studios. Adito or Nojobi, publicly known as Just Adito, is a certified pediatric nutrition consultant, activist, and philanthropist. She is an indomitable force that champions conversations that tackle malnutrition, all forms of abuse, insecurity, girl-child education, and poor governance. Amongst her numerous achievements, it's her podcast, 
Baby Logi Moms on YouTube. On the podcast, Justice, Just Adita Home breaks down complex concepts on nutrition into digestible and additional advice, making it easy for mothers to implement positive changes in the diet and lifestyle of their families. At her core, Adita Home has a mission to see every Nigerian treated with dignity and respect, regardless of ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. So grateful that you're finally here with us, Adito. I hope it wasn't too much of a problem getting to our studio. So good to see you. Now, I want to ask you, Adito. Good morning, Nigeria. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Antirut. Okay, good morning. Now, I want to ask you, Adito, that you, have, you feel very strongly about nutrition and how the children of today are not being well taken care of. You feel that they have been pushed into a box and there's literally no provisions being made for them. Can you tell us of dire instances that you have experienced of children, what they have had to do to put food on their table? Um, thank you for that. So basically, being a field worker over the years, and um, recently, you know, we've been doing a lot of um, field activities, looking at how our children are surviving in this endemic situation. Parents are struggling, you know, every angle of the system is not, you know, functioning properly. And then my concentration is always every child, we owe these children the right to feed them, we owe them the right to protect them, we owe them the right to life. And then there is hunger in the land, you know. Our children basically can't even get three square meals to eat. Our children basically can't even get, you know, even if it is two square meals, they even can't get standard nutrition to eat. And then this is what the situation of the country has landed them in. Um, going by the last man standing, not to talk about the average man, let's look at the poorest person on the street. Can they afford to get three square meals these days? No, they cannot afford to get three square meals these days. Is the government even putting them into consideration? I don't think the government even has any consideration for them because... You see a, a, a girl child who is supposed to go to school. You see a boy child who is supposed to be in school performing very well, but has not eaten very well, doesn't even have a beverage in his tummy, talk less of a, a loaf of bread in his tummy. How many people can afford to buy a whole loaf of bread to give their children now? We don't see these things happening anymore. And for me, like I said, like I've always said, in Nigeria today, we are not even suffering from hunger what we are suffering from is starvation. Hunger is when you as an adult, you're busy, you're working, or you need to go out, you need to put something in your tummy. You can just pick on anything. Can they even afford to pick on anything? No, they can't even find anything to pick on. So the, 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 the problem we have now is not even hunger. It is starvation. And this is starvation that has resorted to malnutrition. So if you go every angle of the system now, go to the health system, go to hospitals, go to schools, you realize that even in homes, Children can't even feed. We've seen situations where mothers lock these children up and go out to hustle for something for them to eat. And they come back with empty hands. And these children do not have anything to eat. We see our children going to bed on empty stomach these days. You see, our children who are even supposed to eat something light can't even afford to eat something light. You can imagine a child drinking gari. You can imagine a child, three people having to share a loaf of bread. And it is as bad as it is. Does the government understand this? I don't think so. Because if the government understands that it is, it is, this is their primary responsibility, and this is where they should diverge all the attention. Look at during COVID, when Governor Babajide Sonwolu was giving out palliatives, governors were giving out palliatives. Nobody gave the children anything. They didn't even think that these children need to take formula. They didn't even think that these children need beverage. Our children cannot survive on what adults survive on. Their own food standard and regulation and ROD, a recommended daily allowance of nutrient tickets, is different from what we adults take. We go out every day and we see these children dying in hospitals. We go out every day and we see these children wandering on the streets begging. Is this the Nigeria that we want for our children? Is this, what, is this how bad the economy has turned it out to? You can't even give children pampas. Go to hospitals. Children are sick on the hospital beds of sepsis. You want to treat a child with huge medication. The tummy is empty. The weight does not even meet up with the percentile assessment of what is weight you carry. If these children are not nutritionally healthy, how do you want to treat? So they sit down there on the hospital beds. You look at academic performance over the years. It's bad. Because our children, even the airlines that, that can easily feed, you know, manage something, they feed on junks. So okay. you realize that nutrition, like I've always said, is the only thing that builds... And nutrition is the only thing that can destroy. Okay. And lack of government attention and concentration 
towards these children and their nutrition has messed up a lot of things in our system. And indirectly, they do not understand that the consequences of this neglect bulges down to the health system and the educational angle as well. Our oh. children are no longer performing very well. Okay, Apart let me from ask the you. fact that there is moral decadence, there's also nutritional challenges affecting them. Okay. Those days when we were young, when we were in school, they used to give us anti-malaria. They used to deworm us. They used to do all of this. How many, how many of the government officials are doing that these days? Okay. You kill whatever chop, now you won't give antibiotics. You kill whatever chop, now you won't deworm. <laughs> you know, okay. so government needs to start to look at it that building a new Nigeria, saving this country from this situation, we need to concentrate on feeding our children. That's our primary responsibility. Okay, I want to ask you... People say, oh, this global thing is everywhere. This global thing is everywhere. Trust me. It's everywhere, but their own government is helping. Their own government has a structure where they give kids some, you know, amount of money. Here in the UK, they give about 23 to 30 pounds per week, which sums up to about 120 pounds in a month. If an average woman in Nigeria gets 50,000 for her own child, now nah, this, this solution is, is slightly help. Okay, let me ask but you. The whole body is still on. Sorry, sorry, Go sorry, ahead. sorry to cut you short because I really wanted to ask you another question. As we all know, during COVID, palliatives were Go mismanaged. Ahead. I said, as we all know, during COVID, palliatives huh? were... As we all know, during COVID, palliatives were mis mismanaged. Yes. In terms of distribution, yes. what do you think can be done differently to curb malpractices in the process of distribution? Who needs to be called on board, aside from now, government bodies, to ensure that palliatives this time around are being channeled with transparency so that every household, every child will benefit from this gesture. Okay, thank you. So let's look at COVID, for example. Let's take COVID as a sampler. During COVID, it wasn't as if there was no food available. Government gave out foods. Individuals, you know, contributed to government, support, um, supported government. They hoarded these palliatives in barns, in warehouses, and then years after, we started to see this palliative. Listen, this is a system. And one, one thing is, religion plays a key role, whether we like it or not, in Nigeria today. So these religious people, we can bring them on board. Call Catholic people, Redeem has the largest number of churches. Celestia has a huge number of churches. There are imams and mosques. There are um, Catholic people. Um, what do you call these people? Jehovah Witness, they go around. Call all these people on board. Look at NGOs, non-governmental organizations are the ones who reach the last man standing. They know the slums. They know where people are hiding. They know where people who don't want to be part of, you know, what is happening, where they just sit down on their own remotely. Call all these people on board. If you give this palliative to government officials, they are going to call their APC members or PDP members and tell them, okay, call our party leaders, and then they share. These party leaders don't share. There's no equitable distribution of commonwealth. There's no equitable distribution of common needs. Call all these people. This is not politics. This is governance. Governance is an embodiment of everybody, me, you, and everybody. Call these people on board. Let there be a database. Share it among them. Let all the regional pastors come. Let imam, let people go to their mosque. Turn all these places into local government. Let people go and then paste this information in public spaces. Let people see. The problem this government has is they feel they are working, but you're working without the people knowing that you're working. Tell us who you are handing over to. What quantity are you handing over to? There's a database. People have their NIN. People have their voters card. Let's apply this same method. And it becomes a transparent thing and open thing. But now they said that they are going to start sharing ice. Governor Babajide Sonwolu said he's going to start to do mama put. Are, are the children going to leave their school, their classrooms, to come and queue for food? Are people going to leave their place of work to come and queue for this food? It doesn't work out that way. Then we started to talk about it. Okay, then they said, okay, but people, uh, their parents can take this food and keep it for them. So I that I'm working, I'm going to go and queue for food for five children. You know, look at somebody died the, a few days ago just because they were buying bag of rice for 10,000. Do we have to suffer for what belongs to us? This is our right. It's not a favor. We shouldn't be begging. We shouldn't be questing for it. They should look for pa uh, channels for us to get this thing. Children go to school, let them take this thing to schools. They have BRT buses, declare BRT buses free, and then let people go, put these things on BRT buses, empower people to move around to different regions and then share these things. And everybody would at least be, be okay. We're not saying everybody's gonna be happy. Right now, we're not looking to be happy. We're just looking to at least sustain. We're, we're, we're looking for sustainability okay. of what is going on until we're able to come out of it. Palliatives being shared to politicians is a no.
there is always sentiment. If you give it to PDP person, PDP people will not allow LP to come and collect. LP will not allow APC or ABGA. You know, they will start calling their family people. There are so many times when I'm walking on the street. You know, you just see some people cluster together and you see them calling people. They will tell them these ones are party people. They are saying they are giving people money and they are sharing it through a form. Come and fill form. You see them reprinting <laughs> and calling their own people to come and fill. Okay. And other people are, they... are like, does this thing belong to us? I did so. I'm, I, 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 I love your passion, and I, and I hope that every Nigerian watching this program today <laughs> will instantly key, in, will key into what you're saying, but will feel the passion the way you feel it. Because I think feeling the passion and actually addressing the problems and discussing it is also a way forward. But anyway, stay with us. Don't go anywhere soon. I want to face um, Ogaken here. <laughs> <laughs> now, you saw how to spoke so passionately yeah. about palliatives. But if I recall, there was a time they were doing that 25,000 a month palliatives yes. for six months for 15 million Nigerians. They didn't even do it up to six months. What they wanted was that they said it was going to be done for because six months. It was going to be done for six yes. months. But they didn't do it because fraud occurred. There was a lot of fraud that, that happened. But even looking at that, they, they mm. said they were going to give 15 million people. Yes. The World Bank says 43% of Nigerians live under poverty below line. Below poverty below, line, below, yes. below poverty line. Yes. And we are give or take 150, 200 million people. Yes. So that automatically means at least a million, 100 or 75 million people. Yes are living on the poverty, poverty line. line. So these 15 million that they were going to give these palliatives to yes. on a monthly basis, mm. what is the criteria for being part of the 15 but million? But that's exactly what we've been talking about. You know, funny enough, the uh, when they said they were going to investigate the ministry, mm -hmm. I felt that this was what that should have been on board. The president was very passionate about the fact that he increased to 15 million people. If you look at the 774 local governments and you divide 15 million people equitably, exactly, it's a drop in the ocean. Yeah. But now this 25,000 naira that he extended for six months, there's nothing happening. They put a, a, a federal government ministerial committee headed by a, mm -hmm. a, a minister of finance, Edu, and a couple of other ministers. And what they have been telling us is that they are going, they are yeah, going. People are hungry. At this point in time, we shouldn't be hearing they are going. Aside from people we should hear that the, the fact that the registers go to each of the local governments. If you display these registers per word, mm -hmm. just like what INEC does, if I'm in a ward, I'm from Dokwa, for example, I'm from Ukwani local government, I have 10 words. If I'm in Obiaruku, and you display the names of the people that are there, we will know how those who choose? are genuine. But, but how do you, do you now choose? How do you choose? They, said, you they said the criteria is for those who are, who are not able to pay school fees for their children. But there are many like that. There are those who are not able to go to the farm More like because that they are seen as senior citizens, maybe 65 and above. Oh, okay. But how do you determine those who have been yes. included in that register? But first of all, publish the one you have, let us see, so mm -hmm. that it will be that we are critiquing it. Mm -hmm. Let us see that that 25,000 Naira is getting, because if you give 15 million people 25,000 Naira, it will not be hidden. At least exactly. another 40 million people will know that 15 million people have been given 25,000 mm -hmm. Naira. Mm -hmm. And 25,000 Naira, as small as it is right now in, with the present inflation, will do a whole lot to reflect the economy. Mm -hmm and put money in the pockets of the people. Because once there's money in the pockets of the people, the economy becomes reflected. Mm -hmm. And there will not be so much pressure as we are facing right now. Because, for example, we have been told that 25 million people will face acute food shortage in, by June, July, if nothing is done about food security. Mm -hmm. And if nothing is done about the issues we are facing now as regards inflation in average food items, like we saw on your, yeah. on your earlier uh, program. That but, you did before. But the, now that you're even, yeah, you even talking about there. that, tell us about this Anchor Borea program because you were an, a strong advocate for it. And I tell spoke, us why I spoke it against the Anchor Borea so program. Did it I was feel? like a lone voice in the wilderness. Why did At it that feel? point in time, Emifile was everywhere. At first, I said CBN should not be seen intervening. CBN is not made. He's not meant to be intervening for crying aloud. That's said to be that's supposed to be setting up our monetary policies. Even if you are going to do the Anchor's Boras program, do it through the Ministry of Agriculture. It was bound to fail. It was doomed to fail because first and foremost, no structures were put in place to give those funds. He they said it was a Fadama project. They used 13 states as a pilot scheme, mm -hmm. and we looked at it. I had said it. I said this thing was not going to work. Kebi, it was as if it was about to work in Kebi. We found out that less than 24 percent of those who took these loans did not repay back those loans. Mm -hmm. Most of them used it to go and marry new wives. Funny enough, the same additional who was the who was the minister of agriculture had a very laudable program, which was the e wallet. If you mm -hmm. remember, the e wallet reached 1.2 million Nigerians in 120 days, mm -hmm. and in two years, additional had reached five million farmers, not even Nigerians, farmers who were getting alerts on their phone. Mm -hmm. These alerts will come as a subsidized rate. You go and purchase from agro shops. 
fertilizers. In fact, farmers did not believe that for the first time they were eliminating the corruption that goes on in the petrochemical uh, industry, which is fertilizer. Mm. Because they will sell it, they will give it to them, it will not get to those who actually need this mm -hmm. uh, fertilizer. Because without fertilizer, you cannot provide food. Yeah. And the whole idea was for this food production to arrest our dwindling uh, foreign currency. Because when there is production, you'll be able to sell, you'll be able to export. Mm. And what else was additionally able to achieve? He achieved food security for 25 million Nigerians. Mm. And when, they, when the government of Buhari came, he suspended the e-wallet system, which was very successful. I mean, if you have gone back to the Oronsaye report, why not go back to the e-wallet system? He, the lady in London talked about distribution. If this distribution worked for the first time in the history of Nigeria, why are we not able to now distribute through this additional uh, scheme? Why are we so shy away to say we are adopting what additional did and we have seen that it is successful? Mm -hmm. But you see, every government will want to come and bring in their own policies. And yeah. we see that these policies are not working. Uncle Bora's program should be proved. But the banks too were also as false. Billions of Naira. The recipients who got the loan. Certainly. The banks too. The were banks, also, the, the, the banks, banks too, some of them were not. They were not because they, they, were, well. they, were, they were. When the head, is, ro when the head is rotting. Yes. What do you expect? Okay, right. They saw what was happening in the Central Bank of Nigeria, and that mm. was when we were kicking against the Ankor Boras program. For example, look at the people that died in, in, uh, in Yaba. Seven lives were lost because of a 25 kg of rice that is 10,000 naira. If they had given them vouchers, if they had given them numbers, everybody that is buying, they don't sell until you get your number. Those people will not have died. There's still an efficient way of making this distribution. But because people try to cut corners, people try to do, make, it, make it look like it is my party, like she rightly said, mm -hmm. you give a state governor two billion naira to share palliatives. The palliatives are shared amongst party lines. How do you, does it get to the ordinary woman on the street and the ordinary man on the street mm -hmm. who, is, who doesn't have party affiliations? Okay. Let's get, let's get a little into. I love the fact that I have very, two very passionate guests <laughs> on my show today. This is very interesting. So, Adeto, are you with us? Hello, Madam A. Are you yes, with us? Let me just quickly chip in something to what Uncle Kenny said. Okay. You know, one thing I've studied the government about is when they want to generate revenues, they, they go all the way into the tech to design applications that they can use. Look at the rail system now. They have cowries of how, you know, people can get on the train, get on the buses in Lagos State, and then they have these bands. Why can't our children in school have these bands to get their daily food? Mm. Why can't they have these calories, you know, to tap and then know that you've given this household? We have a household database. Why don't we have a real mail system? In, the, in Europe, you see, they go to drop this food for these children. If mm. we have a database, I think we can work. But government likes to go on database when they have to generate funds, pay your tax, pay your this. But when it comes to spending, they never see an application that can work on how they can spend money. And then mm. they want to go back to the local ways of having to stress people, having to stress people. We did, did you ever see government taking bills to people to say to come and pay? They'll tell you, log on to this website, take on this app and all of that, you can pay. So we can do this for our children as well. Okay. Even if we adults don't care, even if the adults don't care, we care about the children. And we cannot continue to afford to see that our children have become beggars on the streets. We cannot afford to continue to see that our children don't have what their rights are. Okay. You know, go ahead with your question. Okay, at this time, we're going to have to round up this, this section pretty soon. But I want to ask you one last question. When we spoke, you said there's a difference between hunger in the land, starvation, and malnutrition. To the average person, it sounds like Nigeria has all three. But you don't believe so. So what do you believe that we have in Nigeria today as we speak? What we have in Nigeria today is no longer hunger. It has depreciated, derailed from hunger to starvation. Number one, we have economic starvation. Because of lack of funds, people cannot afford to give their children what they desire. Common PAP, the government cannot say bad as bad. Let's give households PAP. Okay. Now, we now have this starvation that it is caused by lack of food on its own. No money is a different thing. There is money, there is no availability of food. So now the situation we are now is there is starvation in the land. And this starvation has resulted to our children being malnourished. Health-wise, they are malnourished. Academically, they are malnourished. Morally, they are malnourished. And I, I have said it several times. We are working, we are speaking, we are striving for the children we call the future of tomorrow. But if you look at it very well, these children, 
We have put them in a kennel. We are trying to paddle them to their future, to their destination, you know, gradually. But they've taken the sticks in their own hand. They paddle their own life now. These children don't care about the consequences of what they do. That is why you realize that it is bad because there is malnutrition in the land. Our children are sick. How many people can afford to buy SMA? How many people can afford to buy NAN? How many people can afford to buy Serilac, which is the most common food? Does the government even understand that they can subsidize for these things? If you're earning 30,000 naira and you have to breastfeed the child for the next six months, after six months, what is the onward complementary feeding plan? The government does not even have it. Even when you go to health centers these days, you see them post all sorts of papers. Put fish, put corn, put crayfish, put maize. They'll tell you to put all of these things. Where do parents find these things? So it has become bad from hunger in the land to starvation. And from starvation to malnutrition. Thank you so much, Tadito. Thank you so much for your heart feels. So, so what we are suffering now is starvation interview. and malnutrition. Thank you so much. We are being so. starved. Thank you. We don't have money. The government is not providing and our children are malnourished. Thank you so much That's again, yet again, because this has been the, one of the most gut-wrenching interviews that we have had to date, and I'm really pleased that you were there to be part of it. Thank you so much, Adetun, for joining us on Perspectives, and I also want to thank you too, it's my pleasure. Mr. Ken, for joining us on Perspectives. It's my pleasure. You know, I will hope that from what both of you have said, yeah. you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and yeah. the government will take do steps to listen to what we have to say and do something about curbing the hunger in the land.